Welcome everyone to our one hour, very timely webinar on approaches to financial regulation and innovation for post-pandemic recovery. My name is Dr. Leon Perlman. I'm head of the Digital Financial Services Observatory, a project of the Columbia Institute for Tele Information at Columbia Business School in New York. Um, although the DFSOs and my primary focus areas are, are now on uh, financial innovation and regulation, the current environment actually takes me back on a personal note to my previous work life, believe it or not, as a molecular virologist making vaccines to counter some very nasty viruses. But here we all are now in very extraordinary times affected by this new scourge, coronavirus. I hope you're all well and safe from the ravages of the pandemic wherever you are. In fact, we have uh, viewers and participants from over 30 countries logging in to view this webinar and hear from our distinguished speakers who have a wealth of experience to share with us and insights on uh, any commonalities and contrasts between the US and emerging market responses to the pandemic. Let me briefly introduce them. Uh, we're honored to have back uh, to speak at the DFSO uh, event, Linda Lacewell, who is superintendent of New York State Department of Financial Services, responsible for regulating financial services and products, including insurance, banking, and financial services laws. Uh, if you've been following the US news, the department has been at the forefront of some very innovative regulatory responses to the pandemic. Amongst her coveted roles, um, Linda served as chief of staff and counselor to the governor, and is also an adjunct professor at uh, NYU School of Law. Uh, we also uh, welcome for the first time to a DFSA event, Greta Bull, CEO of the consultative group to assist the poor, also known as CGAP, who is also director of the World Bank Group. Greta was previously at IFC, and today will bring primarily an emerging market perspective to the discussion. Also, of course, wel welcome back uh, is Chris Colabia, Senior Advisor for Supervisory and Regulatory Policy at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and a good friend of the DSSO. Um, uh, foundation has funded um, over a multi-year period um, the DFSO. Uh, Chris was previously a banking supervisor at the New York Fed and will be our introductory speaker and scene set on the topic. After Chris, we'll have a discussion, which I'm really looking forward to, between Linda and Greta and parallels between the U.S. and emerging markets, uh, how regulators and companies globally have recognized the significant impacts that the pandemic has had on regulation, the markets, organizations, innovation, and consumers. Uh, overall, we'll cover issues of regulatory responses, mechanism to, to efficiently and securely provide government aid, the social impacts and financial inclusion, and consumer uh, protection. Just a note, in the interest of time, there won't unfortunately be any audience questions for today's speakers. So, um, over to you, Chris, to uh, begin the webinar with the scene setting. Good morning, and thank you, Leon. Uh, my name is Chris Calabia, and I'm the Senior Advisor for Supervisory and Regulatory Policy at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, where I'm a member of the Financial Services for the Poor team. And at the Gates Foundation, we believe that every person deserves the chance to lead a healthy and productive life. Our mission is to address inequities in all forms to help realize this vision. We seek to improve the lives of the poor by finding ways to improve access to healthcare and medicine, clean water, good nutrition, education, and economic opportunity, including access to financial services. Now, these goals to promote health and productivity are, of course, universal goals for policymakers everywhere. And today, these goals face challenges on a global scale in the shadow of the pandemic. The scope and nature of the economic impact of COVID-19 is unprecedented in our lifetimes and extends far beyond the impoverished people who have traditionally been covered by social safety net programs. One of our partners, Vital Strategies, which is a global health public organization, conducted surveys this, this spring of households in Ethiopia, Kenya, Nigeria, Tanzania, and Uganda. And they found that anywhere from 50 to 79% of households surveyed expected to run out of food in one week's time. And about 73 to 88% of households in some of those countries expected to run out of money in a week's time without access to further assistance. Now, even in the United States, historic highs in unemployment have raised serious questions about the economic crisis that some households might face. This is especially concerning given that studies done by the Federal Reserve in 2018 found that about 40% of US those households would have difficulty coming up with $400 to cover an unexpected emergency, which raises questions about how long households could go without income, even in upper income countries. Now, fortunately, many governments do seek to alleviate the economic house, uh, hardships on citizens and small, even some small businesses. Some governments are relying on cash transfers to vulnerable consumers. 
that could help to make up for lost income, which in turn could help vulnerable families to adhere to physical distancing requirements. The World Bank estimates that at least 180 countries have launched some form of cash transfers to support vulnerable populations, furloughed workers, as well as small businesses in some countries to weather quarantine. Estimated to have received such payments worldwide so far, or about one in seven. Research that we've sponsored at the Gates Foundation has found that countries with inclusive digital financial services have fared the best in terms of delivering cash transfers to people who have been affected by the pandemic, both in terms of enrolling previously unbanked individuals into accounts for the first time, as well as delivering cash to them through digital payments quickly and safely. Now, in contrast, countries that lacked well-functioning digital infrastructures faced challenges in trying to enroll individuals into accounts and then seeking to provide cash to them. Even in some upper income countries, the press has reported on the challenges that some recipients of relief payments have faced when awaiting payment by physical checks or other means. Now, importantly, policymakers do need to consider not just the digital infrastructure, but also the legal and the regulatory environment that supports the payments infrastructure. As an example, a key barrier in some countries is that it's difficult to open accounts when you lack basic identification documentation. And that's especially true for women and the poor in lower and middle income countries. They can't prove their identities to sufficiently identify themselves and to meet the traditional customer due diligence, due diligence requirements that some firms require to open financial accounts. Now, the Global Standards Setting Body for Anti-Money Laundering, the Financial Action Task Force, recognizes that overly stringent rules can exclude the poor from financial services. And they, for example, have encouraged use of technology and simpler risk-based approaches for applying customer due diligence requirements for low-risk customers and accounts. And the Gates Foundation has partnered with the Columbia University and Digital Financial Services Observatory precisely to explore these two broad subjects, technology and regulation, and how they can benefit the inclusion of women, the poor, and the unbanked in the financial systems of especially lower and middle income countries. We've partnered with Columbia University Business School uh, in 2015 to help launch the Digital Financial Services Observatory at the Columbia Institute for Teleinformation. And we've been pleased to support the leadership of Professor Ellie Nome, Dr. Leon Perlman, and others, as well as the broader staff and leadership of the Institute and DFSO. Today, we're going to continue that dialogue on how policymakers can apply appropriate regulation and technological innovation to help individuals and businesses weather and then recover from the pandemic. So th thank you all for joining us this morning and turning it back to Leon and our guest speakers. Okay, Chris, um, thank you so much, and especially for your kind words. Uh, it's been a pleasure working with you over the past few years. Um, just want to note the uh, from external or internal perspective, the foundation has done some phenomenal work before and, and uh, during this pandemic, uh, much of it uh, behind the scenes, but it seems extending the full capacity of the foundation's focus area. So thanks very much for that. Okay, um, now we turn to the discussion between Linda Lacewell and Greta Bull, if you've just uh, joined us. Um, <clears throat> okay, as we all know, uh, coronavirus has affected every corner of the world, world globally in a very short, dramatic period, uh, with regulators having to react and adapt uh, very quickly. Um, Linda, from your perspective, the global responses to the pandemic from regulators have, have differed widely. What are the, some of the differences you observed, and how has it uh, changed your actions uh, locally? So uh, thank you, Leanne. Let me, let me first uh, acknowledge Columbia Business School and yourself for putting together uh, this tremendous forum. It was a pleasure to be with you pre-pandemic, as I guess we will all now be saying, pre and post-pandemic, and hopefully we get to post sometime soon. Uh, pleasure also to be with Chris uh, from the Gates Foundation. The foundation has been very helpful to the governor um, as we go through this pandemic. So great to be with you again, and a pleasure to meet of course, Greta um, from the World Bank Group, and I very much look forward to this conversation. So um, the impact uh, locally, uh, of course, is intense because as we know, we face in the United States, in New York, certainly, I won't speak for other parts of the world, uh, multiple crises, right? We have the three crises. We have the public health crisis, the pandemic. We've got the resulting economic crisis, uh, which Chris also spoke to. 
and we have the cry for racial justice. And these are connected, they are not independent, they are not siloed, and each reinforces the other to make the impact incredibly intense. Um, I worked for Governor Cuomo for many years. I'm now a member of his cabinet. Uh, I worked for him when he was state attorney general also. And uh, I learned from him what he learned from his father, Mario Cuomo, who was a hero to those who believe in public service in the United States, that government is there to make a difference. We are here to help people. We are representatives of the people. Our power comes from the people. Uh, you mentioned NYU, where I teach, and uh, you know I teach about government integrity and uh, enforcement of the related laws. The point being, we are in positions of trust for the people. So then, as you go through life, what are the needs of the people? And here, the needs of the people are comprehensive and deep with respect to these three crises. So. We have much to do. I'm sure we'll talk about some of this as we go along. But, you know, New York got hit early. The virus came from China to Europe and was in New York State before anybody knew it. Um, the federal government was in charge. Nobody else was allowed to do testing. So New York had no idea what was happening in the state. Uh, and as a result, we had a tsunami of cases and deaths. And I was embedded in the Capitol with the governor's team on a day-to-day -day basis. Working on that, coming back pretty recently to New York City as we have flattened the curve and we're guarding against a second wave, which shows how connected we all are, locally and globally. And I think this is one of the messages as well, and is why I think what you've put together here with the local and the global perspective is so insightful and is an important dialogue. Okay. Um... Yeah, from what well, just from a from a personal perspective, I mean, being in the midst of the pandemic right at the beginning in New York City, uh, I'm glad we flattened the curve. It's uh, and and uh, the governor and yourselves and your team did a tremendous job. Uh, it's, it, the science and the statistics speak for themselves. Um, just as a follow up, uh, Greta, from an emerging market perspective, and similarly, uh, how the policy tools governments have had at their perspective disposal being shaped and developed to address the crisis. Uh, can you perhaps give us some examples of what has been done and uh, would possibly not have been done or considered pre-crisis? Sure. Um, thanks, Leon, um, for the kind invite to participate in this webinar. I think it is always interesting when we put the U.S. and the international perspectives together. Um, the international perspective involves a whole bunch of different countries, so I'll try to um, pull some strands from a lot of those countries together and, and see if I can um, compare it with some of the things going on here. Um, you know, I think um, Linda's opening on, on, you know, the challenges around health and the economy are very, very true um, in emerging markets as well. Um, the racial justice issues that um, are a little different, um, we've been battling poverty and inequality in emerging markets for a really long time um, and have some pieces in place that have helped us to do that. Um, but in some ways, there are a lot of similarities on the issues. Um, apart from the health impacts, which a lot of um, there's been a lot of support to try to address, there's also just the issue of um, support to low-income households and keeping small businesses, which make up the vast majority of, of livelihoods and employment in emerging markets, afloat. Um, and that's where you know I think we see a lot of similarities between the response that's happened in the U.S. and the response that's happened in emerging markets. Um, but there are some pretty big challenges in emerging markets that aren't really the same as what we have here, right? So um, while some countries have put in place sort of PPP type mechanisms um, to help larger enterprises in their countries, for the most part, um, businesses in emerging markets are small and informal. Uh, and so it makes it really hard to reach them. And so, you know, as Chris pointed out at the beginning, um, social protection schemes have been sort of the default of a lot of governments in terms of getting, um, getting money into the hands of people who need it. So we've seen a lot of focus in emerging markets on government-to-person payments. 
Um, but the second challenge that relates to that, and it's a pretty big one in this context, is that most people don't have access to bank accounts in emerging markets. Um, and the payment systems that feed those bank accounts in times like this go from quite sophisticated to pretty patchy. Um, so getting those social payments to low-income people can be a pretty big challenge. Um, and I think what the crisis has really revealed is who's been able to pivot and adjust to that challenge and who hasn't. Um, so, you know, many countries are implementing social protection schemes in emerging markets. According to the World Bank, I think the latest count is 151 countries are, are supporting some kind of social protection or labor-related measure. Um, but there's been a pretty big difference in their ability to respond between countries that had invested in, in their payment systems, particularly pre-crisis, and those that hadn't. Um, at the same time, under the pressure of the crisis, we're seeing a lot of innovation as countries have to scramble to find ways to make things work. But just to you know, give a few examples of, of where we're seeing sort of bright spots, let's call it. I mean, you know, obviously um, the country that gets a lot of attention um, for having invested properly in its systems is India. Uh, and I think what is showing in this is that India's investment in that in that capability is really paying off. Um, so, you know, India has put in place a lot of infrastructure that includes biometric national ID, the unified payment interface payment system, low value accounts that were mandated for all households and a growing network of cash agents. Um, and it hasn't been perfect, but it's been pretty astonishingly good given the numbers that they're dealing with and, and compares pretty favorably to what we've seen in many more developed markets, including the US. And just to give you a sense of that scale, you know, this is a country with serious poverty problems, but at the same time, the government has managed to, to distribute um, 8.7 billion US dollars in very small social payments directly to bank accounts for over 420 million people. So that really emphasizes the importance of that kind of market infrastructure. They had a lot of pieces in place and then they've made them work together pretty well. Um, but as, as was mentioned, you know, in markets where people still don't have accounts, customer onboarding is, is potentially a really big bottleneck. Uh, and we've seen a lot of jurisdictions tackling this in different ways. So, so a number of them have lightened customer due diligence requirements in opening new accounts for benefit recipients of social payments using tiered account structures, that have more flexible customer onboarding requirements. So just to give a few examples, Ukraine um, allows remote account opening now. The Philippines has temporarily eased documentation requirements for low value accounts. Ghana and the Waimu region in West Africa are allowing onboarding using mobile phone registration data for low value accounts. And in Peru, um, financial institutions can actually open new accounts in bulk or individually for GDP beneficiaries without requiring them to sign a contract. Um, beyond that, we've seen just really quickly a lot of public-private partnerships that I think have been really important. So, um, you know, M-Pesa in, in, in Kenya was an early case in point where they agreed to reduce rates for a limited period of time to help government in an emergency. And being able to rely in, in a cash economy on that kind of cash distribution model is pretty important. And we've seen that kind of um, approach taken in countries like Myanmar, Rwanda, and Uganda as well. Um, I'll, I'll stop there. Um, there are lots of other things going on on the liquidity side and support to small business, but we may be able to get into that later. If I may, uh, Leon, comment on that. I mean, I think uh, Greta's remarks really show the importance of preparedness for this type of an event, that once the event occurs, once you have a pandemic or any similar crisis that is disruptive to uh, the main aspects of society, it's... it's uh, it's almost too late if you don't have, as you correctly put it, the infrastructure, which unfortunately we don't currently have in the United States. We saw the federal government struggle to get stimulus payments to people and they ended up, well, I'm gonna rely on your tax return from last year if you had to file one. And you know, I don't know if your circumstances changed and I don't know if you're still living or dead and uh, I don't know if your bank account information is still correct. And uh, many, weeks of delays to even achieve that, uh, which I think was illustrative of this challenge. And then uh, with respect to the, un the unemployment insurance benefits for people who've been furloughed or laid off or just lost their jobs entirely uh, and no longer had an income stream that they would rely on to pay their bills, feed their families, the state uh, uh, IT infrastructure and the payment systems there were not equipped for this kind of volume. And as payments were delayed, then the call centers were overwhelmed. So because people needed their money. 
And we struggled with this in New York as well, because state governments are not that well funded. Infrastructure, IT infrastructure is extremely expensive. And although we were in the middle of starting to modernize our system, again, we were not ready. No state was ready. And uh, it took us a period of time to get up to speed and now we're doing well and people get their money regularly. But, you know, we've got to do better. And uh, the governor's comment, as others have stated, is what do we learn from this as we move forward? How do we build back better? How, to, how do we get our systems to transform? The states have to do it, but the federal government has to do it too. Not only have a central pandemic preparedness and response infrastructure for public health, rather than you know, dozens of states doing things differently, localities doing things differently, and some are having better resources than others, but the economic support that people need, we've got to have a better infrastructure for this. And my hope is that this will be an impetus to those changes being made, certainly in the states and hopefully at the federal level as well. Yeah, uh, totally agree. Um, we'll get back to the infrastructure components and the like uh, shortly, but just quick change of pace to reflect uh, the social uh, changes and events that are taking place um, uh, during the course of the um, period of the pandemic, um, following especially the death of George Floyd uh, and the uh, U.S. and global protests. Um, they've seen a renewed focus on economic justice, and there are now uh, more urban, urgent questions on how we ensure that innovation is inclusive and uh, equitable. Um, Linda, you've been at the forefront of this, just by a lot of the regulations that you've um, issued. Um, but how have uh, your department's regulatory philosophies and approaches to regulation changed because of and in reaction to the pandemic and social changes? What should regulators be doing uh, to help society, as you, as you put it, build back better? So thank you. Good question. So we're fortunate at DFS that our purview is very broad, as you mentioned. Um, we have insurance of all kinds. We have the state banking system. We have, you know, fintech and all other kinds of licensed financial services that uh, and products that are directed to consumers, as well as uh, very healthy innovation division and uh, cybersecurity. So when I first took this position a year ago, I have uh, refocused the agency on consumer protection. And so we were already ramping up in that regard. And then nothing shows you the need uh, to help consumers, right, than a disruptive pandemic. So with public health really overwhelming uh, everybody's lives and the financial aspects of their lives, we took every measure that we could think of. And we had um, any payment that we could think of as a kitchen table issue we addressed. So um, insurance premiums, health, life, property, having those deferred, mortgage payments being deferred even before the federal government really sorted that out for federally insured mortgages, um, you know, for 90 days and then renewed. Uh, and um, having health insurance companies waive the co-pays uh, for, for testing and and then the mental health needs, uh, which emerge from all the stress uh, of, of loss of life and illness from the health pandemic. So making telehealth, mental health more available to people and trying to eliminate those costs. And we also, from the health pandemic point of view, we realized we needed an integrated hospital system and health system. Uh, you know, we have upstate and we have downstate, which is New York City, and every hospital or hospital system is its own thing, yet the impact may be different in different areas. We had to help the hospital system to work as a whole and to share space. We had to help them figure out how to surge their capacity. We had to help the um, hospital labs and other labs to surge their capacity. And really, again, having government leverage all its touch points to make the systems that people rely on work at a much higher level than had ever been anticipated before. Um, and look, with respect to um, George Floyd and the protests, 
you know, some people are protesters, some people are looters, they're different people, small businesses are affected by the looters. So we had our property insurance people help to expedite the claims there. But at more of a top line and more broadly speaking, I think that um, uh, the public health crisis and the economic crisis so stressed our social systems that the, that the George Floyd uh, homicide really just lit that match. Um, and all of the racial injustice and the police issues and the uh, inequities and the tale of two cities uh, in our economic systems, people said enough and they went out and they protested and the important thing there for us in government is how do you use this moment to help to achieve change so that the protests are not in vain because uh, that would be terrible. And uh, government is not about talk, it's about action, it's about getting things done, it's about making a difference. Um, in New York, uh, before the George Floyd incident, in response to a series of police-involved shootings of individuals, we had already addressed the conflict of interest of having the local district attorney investigate that given their very close relationship, working relationship with the police departments by assigning those matters to our state attorney general who's independent from local police departments so that she could investigate those and determine uh, whether anything was handled incorrectly there and achieve some credibility and some public trust, which was very much needed. But in addition, beyond that, after these protests, the governor said, I fund the localities, which fund the local police departments. And I'm now directing these localities to come up with a, a policing, a law enforcement plan forward going that makes sense for that locality. Uh, what is the budget? What is it to be spent on, right? There's a movement you know, it's called defund the police. They don't mean eliminate the police department. They mean what is the reach of the police department and what are they using and what is the money being spent on? And do we really need sort of like, you know, war arsenals in police departments? And should the police department be handling traffic and schools and, and other issues that don't generally involve, uh, you know, high level criminal activity? And so each police department now has to come up with a plan that the community approves before they get funded in the next year's budget. So again, we look for every touch point we can um, to work with the communities and to hear their concerns and to brainstorm and, and work with experts and foundations and, and uh, universities and the like. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it's never enough, it's never enough because the needs are tremendous and when I worked directly for the governor, who's a very demanding individual, not that I'm not, uh, you know, <laughs> I, I did and I did and I did and I worked and I worked and I worked and I finally said to him, it's never enough. And he said, that's right. It's never enough because it really is never enough. There is always more to do and the needs are imperative now and we've got to keep working and as difficult as it, as it is for everyone, we all have to put one foot in front of the other. And we've got to work smarter and more inventively and more innovatively. And we've got to change the way we've been doing business across the board. Okay. Um, I think you've got a great vantage point um, as a member of the cabinet to, to be at the, uh, at the forefront of uh, solving these, these integrated and intertwined and interlinked uh, uh, issues, which, uh, as you said, is a kind of like a, a tinderbox uh, exacerbated by the, uh, what happened with George Floyd and, uh, of course, um, the pandemic and uh, really strong leadership is needed uh, to catalyze these changes and, and uh, uh, these initiatives. Um, similarly, uh, Greta Seagap uh, has got a, uh, similar but different vantage point. Uh, its DNA is in emerging markets um, on issues related to financial inclusion, which of course is um, bringing folks who are unbanked or don't have access to financial services into, into the financial ecosystem and concentrating on equitable growth um, for them um, in emerging markets. 
so similarly, and just following up on Linda's points, uh, how do you see demands for more equitable growth here in the U.S. affecting emerging markets? Um, and especially how is technology and financial sector innovation accelerating the push for greater inclusion? Yeah, um, so I, you know, I, I think people have been paying attention to the, the George Floyd issue and the equitable growth debate here in the US, but I, you know, I'm not sure how much of an impact it's having in emerging markets because frankly, we've been dealing with big poverty and in inequality issues for many years, course, it's yes. a known problem, right? <laughs> Um, and in the financial sector, you know, this goes back to work in the 1960s. This is where the microfinance movement came from. And, and then it sort of got a new shot in the arm in the 90s when, uh, you know, you saw sort of the emergence of the modern microfinance movement, as some people call it. Um, so this has been a topic of debate and, you know, understanding the impact that those innovations have had um, on poor people has been ongoing work for a long time. What is having a pretty huge impact is technology and innovation. Um, and this is really sort of turbocharged that debate in emerging markets. So if you sort of think about it as a continuum, obviously, and innovation like M-Pesa was really the spark that lit the fuse, right? So it demonstrated that non-banks with strong distribution capabilities could bring a lot of people safely and securely into the formal financial sector. Um, when you're dealing with a financial sector that's all cash-based, you know, being able to um, find a way to digitize and de-digitize that cash is pretty important. And then you had sort of following waves, subsequent waves, um, e-commerce and social media in China created another big wave of inclusion. And, you know, China has been a success story for raising people out of poverty in the last 20 years. And it has been quite remarkable. And then, you know, we spoke about India earlier, where a more government driven infrastructure approach has been pretty effective. Um, and payments technology and a shift in how we think about banking for the poor has driven a lot of innovation and countries keep learning from each other and deepening that innovation and it, and it shows in the numbers. So we've dramatically in the last um, 10 years reduced the number of unbanked people in the world. So we have some of the tools we need to start tackling this. I think then there's the bigger question about whether any of these innovations in the financial sector have any impact in the lives of poor people. And that's the thing that a lot of us are grappling with. I think there's a pretty clear evidence base, for example, that access to some sort of payment system does actually have a positive impact. It allows people to draw on much broader safety nets that they might have had, it, which then enables them to be able to use their time a little bit more effectively. There's been a lot of work that's that's demonstrated that, you know, having access to just remittances networks and internal payment systems is, is pretty important. We know that savings and insurance that are delivered to low income people are really important in building resilience. Um, the record on credit is a little bit more um, mixed. I think there are some positive signs that credit make makes a big difference. Um, you know, there's a study in India done that not that long ago because there was a huge um, uh, non-payment crisis in in India, a huge over indebtedness crisis actually, and so money just came out of that system. And of course, you know, it caused consumption to drop. It caused casual wages to drop. All, you know, you take liquidity out of a system, duh. You know, it causes the system to shrink. It causes the economy to shrink. But, you know, credit is a two-edged sword. And so there have been some studies that have shown it does make a difference. And there are others that have, have shown that it's it's not as impactful. But I think across the board, there's sort of emerging evidence that having access to deeper financial, a deeper financial sector really does make a difference in the lives of the poor. Um, yeah, let me stop there. Okay. Um, I, uh, at the end, of time permits. Um, again, very important comments. I, I think, look, historically in the United States, uh, you know, we have this uh, this sort of you know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps approach. Yet at the same time, we have deep income inequality, and. Uh, uh, you know, race relations that started with, as they say, the original sin, and income inequality to me as I, as I learn more, it's not just about income, right? It's access to financial systems. So yes, if your income is lower, that is a huge problem. But if you can't get a loan, if you can't get credit, if you can't get a bank account, yeah. it's not even in the system at all. And then on top of that, because you are vulnerable, you are marketed and sold the worst poisonous financial products and services with massive interest rates and fees that drive you deeper into debt, then you never get out of that hole. And apart from through our great education system, it's incredibly difficult to climb into the middle class uh, or beyond. And I think there has been 
both an ignoring of that on the theory that everybody's supposed to make it, you know, themselves without understanding that people are starting with all these disadvantages uh, that are perpetuated throughout their lives. And also a little bit of, um, the governor talks about New York arrogance, you know, in sort of a, a fun, friendly way, but there's an American arrogance too, which is United States, we're a great rich country, and then there's the developing world and they're poor. So microfinance, microinsurance is something that, you know, we help uh, in those countries. Well, guess what? We have some very poor areas here in the Bronx and Buffalo, Appalachia, other parts of our country. Um, and some of the things that we're funding and advocating and uh, proving in the, in the third world uh, could be used here as well. Um, and then to, I think one of the points that Greta might have been starting to make about innovation. You know, the innovators out there, FinTech, InsurTech, all kinds of techs, any kind of innovation. What is the problem that you are trying to solve? And is it a real problem or is it another nice, fun, shiny object for people who already have plenty of money who would like to manage the, the tremendous finances that we already have and you're gonna make their lives easier and more innovative and more connected? And you know, we, we had talked about this, Leon, a little bit uh, when I was here, in, I think it was February. So, you know, we need innovators to step up and, and use this moment also to invent and perpetuate innovative products or new ways of doing things that help real people, that help the poor, the lower middle class, the middle class, help everybody take the moment. You don't have to be in government to serve. Everyone can serve in a way. And, you know, I've heard many innovators say, well, we need, you know, we need regulators, everybody else to be like open to our products and we need people to uptake our products and services. Well, the regulators are going to be a lot more open to it and a lot more interested in spending time giving you the support you need if you're going to actually address any of the crises that we have right now, public health, the economy, jobs for people, uh, uh, helping people who are unbanked, underbanked, and of course, uh, in the area of social or, or racial justice. And I, I make that call legitimately. And, you know, we do have some initiatives that we've put out, uh, which you guys can look up, New York Next, New York Forward, um, where we're trying to work with innovators to try to bring this about. But the innovators themselves also have to become diverse. And I've made this point before also. The innovators, the fintechs of the world are not necessarily that diverse themselves. The financial services sector is not that diverse. Where are the people of color and women on the boards and in the executive suites or as the founders of all kinds of financial products and services, banking, insurance, fintech, and all of that, especially when studies show that if you want to innovate, be diverse, because diversity brings creativity, which is what we all need right now. And so we're going to be leaning into this area as well to take a look at what is the diversity of the entities that we supervise and how can we measure that and be, help make it transparent, which is always the first step. And how do we help support and engender further diversity? Because again, as you mentioned, these things all interconnect. They all interconnect. I mean, I am a woman of some diversity. My mother was born in Calcutta. I don't know to what degree is that a component of my zeal to engender diversity in financial services and products and to put energy there. I don't know. You don't have to be a woman of diversity to have that impetus, but it certainly helps. And the more diversity that we can engender across government, across regulators, across innovators, across financial services and products companies, the more innovation we will get, the more it will help people and hopefully bring us to a better place. Yeah, um, I, I, that, that's a great segue actually to uh, the next set of questions, which are, are similarly directed and, and focused, uh, talk about innovation um, and especially as it addresses uh, the issues of governments across the world having to issue, uh, as you spoke about, stimulus payments quickly. In the US it's called pay, uh, Paycheck Protection Program, PPE, and Unemployment Insurance, uh, whereas in, in the emerging markets it's known 
uh, as GTP or government to person payments. Uh, as we know, these these payments haven't gone smoothly everywhere, of course. As you pointed out, the infrastructure hasn't been there. Uh, expect, uh, especially with unexpected technical and logistical issues. My favorite is one of the states doing unemployment uh, insurance. The systems crashed, um, as you mentioned, uh, uh, Linda, uh, because their systems are running on 1950s era COBOL. Um, and there, there was a call for retired COBOL programmers to come out and bootstrap this thing to, to, to cope with the, the, the surge. Uh, of course, there are new digital payment systems and digital infrastructures that uh, can address that. Um, just circling back again, Greta, from CGAP's close ties globally to the pulse of the innovation, because you, you deal with a, a, a lot of innovators and a lot of papers and studies that you issue. Um, in terms of the, the, the innovation born of necessity, has the role of innovation evolved as a result of the pandemic to address any of these challenges in terms of payments or, or credit or, or the like? Well, you know, I mean, it, it was already evolving at a pretty rapid clip because I think people saw that there was this huge opportunity at the bottom of the pyramid. But I want to build on something that um, Linda said. I think the difference between most emerging markets and the U.S. is that, you know, there are a small group of people who tend to have access to the financial system and then everybody else. And what the innovation has done is sort of to bring everybody else in and then you can start building on that sort of payments capability and, a, and basic account functionality to provide services to people. And the big challenge, though, is that a lot of poor people in emerging markets just don't have a lot of money. And so making a business case for that stack up is really challenging. Um, I think technology makes it more possible, but, um, you know, it's still it's still work in progress, let's say. Um, and I think one of the important um, things that we have to really think about as this happens is supporting that innovation while keeping an eye out for some of the predatory practices that you know, we see here in the United States. Because I think there are real um, risks that we kind of build in that, um, that sort of predatory nature of some financial services um, in, into some of the new innovative services that are being provided. So, you know, consumer protection becomes really, really important as we go into these systems. But, you know, to your question, I think we are seeing a lot of um, innovation. We're seeing sort of an acceleration of that innovation right now. Um, so, you know, we've talked about government to person payments, and there's been a lot of learning in how to make that work better. Um, you know, we go from sort of the India situation I described earlier to a country that we're working in in the Middle East that is literally distributing cash out of the back of a truck. You know, the army's doing it. So, you know, you can see sort of the challenge that countries that haven't dealt with this are dealing with. And so, you know, a lot of countries are really having to scramble to figure out how to put together the payment systems to get money out into the hands of people who need it. Um, but, you know, in other related areas, we're seeing a big push, for example, in the e-commerce, informal e-commerce systems. So in, in emerging markets, there's a lot of trade that goes on through Facebook, you know, putting up a storefront on Facebook and, you know, getting goods to people uh, through more informal means. And I, I expect we'll see that proliferate. We've seen a lot of development of things like gig work. Um, and, and, you know, I, again, speaking to some of the risks that come along with these things, we have to keep an eye on, on what happens when you get sort of financial services embedded into some of those other platforms that could be used to sort of lock people into specific gig platforms or, or other um, channels that, that sort of are kind of like a new sort of sharecropping system almost, right? So I think there are things that we need to watch out for as, as this innovation happens. I think from a, there's also, you know, a real challenge from the regulatory perspective, right? So what we're seeing in emerging markets is that the financial services value chain is, is kind of being disintermediated in a lot of ways. So, you know, rather than having a bank that sort of does everything and really for cost reasons has a pretty tough time serving the bottom of the pyramid, you're finding different parts of that um, value chain being provided by different parties, right? So some of it might be, uh, you know, the distribution part, um, you know, what we think of as branches, but agents cash in, cash out being handled by, say, a mobile network operator. Uh, the payment system might be being handled by um, a, an over-the-top player like WhatsApp, right? In India, you've got all these guys coming in and providing that kind of front-end service. Um, you've got credit providers that are just doing digital credit. So there's this sort of boom in, in innovation with different parties taking different parts of that, that 
financial services delivery uh, and, you know, serving low income populations, mass market populations. But, you know, as a regulator, how do you keep on top of that? So I was looking at um, a couple of years ago, digital credit, which has boomed across Africa. Um, and, you know, I was able to get some data on, on the growth of digital credit in Zambia because they happen to have a project with uh, FSD Africa to sort of understand what was going on in their credit markets. Literally no other country in the region had any clue how much digital credit had grown. This is, you know, very similar to credit card debt. Um, but it, it just exploded across all these countries. And regulators, I think, have a hard time kind of keeping on top with what's going on, much less making sure that there aren't predatory practices practices embedded in it. So I think, you know, the, the technology revolution that we've seen in emerging markets has had a huge impact and opens up massive opportunities, but it opens up very big risks as well. And that has implications for providers, for consumers, and for regulators. And, and we need to really think about new approaches for keeping an eye on, on um, some of the predatory practices that will inevitably come out in a, in a situation where, you know, putting together a business case isn't that easy. So, you know, it's, it's, we're in a, a time of incredible innovation and change, uh, but that's going to create some challenges as well. And, and I think equipping um, emerging markets regulators and supervisors to keep up with some of those challenges is going to be a really important part of our work in the coming years. Well, I think I think that's a very important point. First of all, nobody has all the answers, and that's why we have to talk to each other. And I can't, as a regulator, come up with what is the right product or service or payment system. All I can do is to try to help set the conditions in the market so that those who can innovate are incentivized to do so in areas that are helpful to people. But in addition to that, you are right that the pace of change is accelerating dramatically. And it is very difficult for anybody to keep up, especially when you've got multiple areas of purview. But, you know, that's why regulators need to talk to innovators and experts and foundation leaders. Um, and regulators have to talk to each other, right? Not only do, are we talking with our federal counterpoints, but we talk to <clears throat> regulators, uh, certainly starting with Europe, across Europe, I made a trip there and met with uh, regulators in London and Paris and, and Frankfurt and with EOPA and uh, we were doing uh, memorandums of understanding um, in areas of innovation and otherwise and with money laundering cooperation because one of the things which you alluded to that sometimes gets left out of the equation when people talk about innovation is yeah, you're innovating and you're providing a new product or service to somebody, but what is the other impact of that? Um, are we avoiding money laundering and sanctions violations? Are we uh, making sure that consumers are not being exploited by owner's terms? And are we making sure that the, uh, the company providing this is not being victimized by fee for hacking or cyber problems or so on? So my main point would be it takes all of us. I do not have the answers, but I can have the conversation and we can set incentives and we want to partner. So if you're out there listening to this and you have an idea and you want to partner with us, please reach out. Or if you have ideas for discussion, uh, we want to engage. Uh, yeah, thanks. I mean, you've, you've created great rails for um, impactful innovation um, in terms of your innovation office. You just want to expand on those initiatives for those who are not fully aware of it and um, who have that can contact you or your staff to engage? Yes, yeah, so uh, Matt Homer is the head of our research and innovation division, and uh, uh, we can make sure that people know how to contact him. Also through our website, dfs.ny.gov, you can find your way to the, uh, the innovation section, which explains a lot of our initiatives, in, including uh, some virtual currency related innovations that we're doing where we're trying to open up that market uh, to more emerging entrepreneurs and offering things like the possibility of a conditional license where you combine with others or site at a university, um, a general opening up of our uh, conversation around uh, licensing for innovation. 
Have you seen in that realm uh, any new business models and approaches evolve in the past few months that you weren't that surprised you or uh, that you weren't expecting? Right. So um, this sort of in the virtual currency world, uh, which sort of used to be sort of more boutique, seeing you know the big players, Fidelity and others coming in and saying we want a license to do a certain model, but also since we've um, suggested conditional licensing and other types of innovation, we've been approached already uh, by a number of potential licensees, you know, currently under review, um, which I don't think would have happened unless we announced these programs and that we were open for business and open for discussion. So that's what I mean about sort of generating conditions where innovation can flourish uh, and we're working very closely with some of them. One of the very interesting things that we announced was a partnership with our state university system, which is all across the state, not just New York City, um, where, as you know from the university world, uh, uh, innovation flourishes and people are interested in virtual currency and blockchain and all of that. And so what we're working with the university system to try to get them some type of a license or a conditional license so that they can work with virtual currency companies. And that will help not only to flourish innovation, but it helps our universities, our next generation leaders, um, putting together intellectual capital with uh, entrepreneurs and financial capital with the regulator being a facilitator you know, again, we don't pick the winners or losers. I can't come up with what the innovation is, but if you've got the idea and you're willing to put in the sweat equity, uh, you can go partner with a campus and with the, with the brains there and be helping on multiple levels. Okay, great. Um, just moving now to uh, something we alluded to a bit earlier is uh, cybersecurity and um, consumer protection uh, with a dramatic shift, of course, to everybody online. Here we are. We Last time we all met, we were in a big room at Columbia University, some of us. Uh, so it's a dramatic shift uh, online for everything, and it's likely to be, unfortunately, for quite a while. Um, there's obviously a need to enhance consumer protection to, uh, to ensure the safety of financial and other transactions, as well as need to augment data protection measures as, as online has become a honeypot for bad actors, um, especially in face of reported increases in ID fraud, not just in, uh, just globally, I've seen reports everywhere. Um, uh, government aid is a honeypot for bad actors. Um, so for Linda, uh, have you seen any increase in cyber attacks, enterprise on financial systems, hacking attempts on consumer uh, devices through uh, phishing, data leaks, ID fraud, I mean, all these dystopic issues which have come to the fore and now part of the, the vernacular and any resultant um, uh, monetary loss. Uh, specifically, what measures have you put in place or planning um, to put in place for consumer protection and cybersecurity? So I believe cybersecurity is the biggest risk to businesses and governments everywhere, bar none. I've said this before, and that's why when I took this position last year, I created the first uh, cybersecurity division for any financial regulator at the same level as banking and insurance and consumer protection. Um, and uh, DFS has, as you know, developed the uh, best practice uh, cybersecurity regulations for the financial industry, which um, the FTC and the National Insurance Association and others have used as a model. And I know in Europe, they're looking very closely at them as well, based on my conversations with regulators there. And it is a very important part of safety and soundness. It is a fact, unfortunately, that businesses, including financial services companies, are continually being attacked, right? If they had to report every attack, they would be doing that all day long. The question is which ones uh, advance in any respect uh, and, and how do you guard against them? And so it's part of our examination process. But in addition, our cybersecurity head, who is a former federal prosecutor, who was the, uh, the head of cyber crimes in the U.S. Attorney's Office in the District of New Jersey and did very high profile cases involving state actors um, and uh, 
the, the sort of biggest intrusions, both politically and from an industry point of view. So he understands all the tricks. And um, he is definitely monitoring this. I don't think I'm giving any way any secrets to say yes, the volume of these attempted attacks has gone up dramatically. And I feel good that for our licensed entities, they already built up a strong system as a result of our regulations. But that doesn't mean it's going to always be successful. And we are both being vigilant about making sure that those changes have been made and that it's at a high level and that companies are taking them seriously. Um, and we are engaged with industry about how can we make improvements because um, if your company is hacked and it goes down, then it doesn't, no other aspect of what you've been doing really matters because you're not going to be able to do anything and you may lose your most valuable assets uh, and you may have ransomware where you're being asked to pay a lot of money. And one of the other things we're looking at is cyber insurance, which is a very important area. I don't think it's very sophisticated right now, generally speaking. Um, I think it's been sort of an afterthought by property insurers. Let me also throw in a little cyber insurance. And we've got to do a better job there. And we've got to make sure that the incentives are aligned between insurance providers and businesses and uh, um, Homeland Security, so to speak. We have an increasingly interconnected world. The more we do online, the more innovation there is. If one company goes down, what else is it connected to? Is there systemic uh, security risk? The answer is yes. Well, then what do we do about significant third parties who are connected? What about these third party providers to industries that are near monopolists and you know the cloud services and the like who don't feel like they need to negotiate with their uh, customers of these, of these uh, services? and their incentives are not aligned. Um, we have to do more. The federal government has got to get involved. These are top level security issues. It feeds into the security of our elections. Everybody saw what happened on Twitter when a teenager hijacked the system. And yeah, it is kind of like, uh, like, a, like a bad uh, high school movie, right? But my point is, if a teenager can do it, then a real bad person, a state actor, anybody who wants to cause real damage can do it. And if you can take over somebody's Twitter account in the middle of an election or in connection with securities markets or whatever it might be, and who is regulating Twitter? If anybody knows the answer to that question, I guess the answer is the FTC. But it's not a real answer given the scope of what they can do. Um, and we have publicly stated that we're looking at that, so more to come and a lot of lessons to be learned, I think. Yeah, uh, important issue. And just, just to say, I mean, there, there, there are lots of ways of approaching cybersecurity, but uh, you may or may not be aware, but uh, we at the DFSO have been busy for the past two years. Yes. Uh, with funding from the foundation on a specific bootstrap new approach to cybersecurity to prevent uh, and respond and um, instill resilience through what we call our um, actionable risk management framework, which has been, uh, which the effort I've led in conjunction with my colleague, um, uh, Keith. Uh, and that, that should, that's going into beta quite, uh, quite soon. It's a, it's a comprehensive risk management framework that looks at every actor in the financial ecosystem, especially in emerging, uh, emerging markets. Uh, and to that point, Greta, um, what do you see as the primary, and briefly within the two, three minutes we have left, what are the primary consumer protection risks arising from the crisis you've come across? Well, I, I'd actually like to respond a little bit to what Linda said, because I think those are important issues in oh, emerging okay, markets sure. too. Um, first of all, never underestimate the disruptive potential of teenagers. Um, I have to <laughs> uh, they can disrupt like nobody's business. But I, you know, I think to this point, you know, the proliferation of services that get patched together in different ways um, leads to the proliferation of risks, right? So one of the interesting features of something like M-Pesa is, you know, this was a this is a payment system, mass payment system that's based on technology that was created for sending SMS messages, right? So you can imagine the kind of 
uh, cyber risks that opens up. I think they've ridden on the notion that every little transaction is so small that it's not a massive risk. But I think it's easy to take those kinds of things for granted. And I know the industry is looking at how they make um, it more robust, but we've got entire payment systems that are riding on that kind of technology. And so I think there's a lot of work to do there. But as we go into this kind of API economy where everything's sort of a platform that's knitted together through APIs um, with different providers leveraging each other's capabilities and data and payments services, that just, you know, exponentially increases the kind of cyber risks that you have in the system. But um, beyond that, just from, you know, that's sort of from a provider perspective, but I think from a consumer perspective, there are really important implications in terms of people's data, right? And CGAP's done some work on, on how we need to think about really different data protection and privacy paradigms. And I think this is an absolutely urgent matter that we need to wrestle with soon. You know, how do we start putting some of the responsibility for data protection and privacy, not entirely on consumers who don't read these long, awful consent forms, but on providers themselves. And so how do we make providers more liable for the data breaches that, that could happen on their services? And um, just to say, you know, we always assume that poor people, you know, privacy doesn't matter. They're gonna be willing to trade um, access for privacy any day. Well, we've done research that suggests that's exactly not true. People um, on very low incomes are willing to pay more for products that have stronger privacy protections. And so I think we have to sort of get rid of that assumption and, and really um, push to make um, both cybersecurity, but also data protection and privacy much more robust. We are far behind in this country on that. Uh, and we really need to push it out in, in emerging markets as well. So I think there are a lot of consumer protection risks that are, are coming out of this crisis, but just out of technology and innovation and we are behind on, on dealing with a lot of these. Thanks, Greta. We, we're just about out of time, although I think between all of us, we can carry on for, for a good few hours, um, I think. Uh, let me just uh, thank you both. And uh, uh, Chris, if you're still there, uh, for your opening remarks. Um, Greta, Linda, thank you for a very insightful conversation. I've learned a lot. I'm sure the, the few hundred people on this webinar have too covered a lot of ground um, and, and very simply from the from the comments there are a lot of common challenges around the world so uh, uh, in, um, discussions between regulators and innovators around the world are, are critical to go forward and solve these challenges as is political leadership um, and uh, as we said um, we need political leadership to handle the crisis so uh, and, and, and sketch a pathway to to, uh, to fixing the issues uh, so we can all build back better. We're all hoping for a vaccine, of course, sooner rather than later. Um, so thanks again to everybody who's joined us. And as a reminder, next week we have um, Columbia, uh, the DFSO virtual summit around the same time. The registration is now, uh, now open, but it's going pretty quickly. So the limited number of Zoom uh, slots still available. Uh, so please register. So this reminds for me to say, uh, stay safe safe, stay healthy, and goodbye from the DFSO uh, in New York.